friends, welcome to episode 199 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 16th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian... This podcast has something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Jen in Iowa, Shelley in Florida, Amanda in Louisiana, Abby and Stephanie in New Hampshire, Jillian in New York, and David in the state of Washington. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I will be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now a word from our official sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning Pebble Go Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I am so excited to be working with them. Friends, I'm so excited. Angie Kultoff from Capstone, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me again. I'm hoping you can help us understand uh, this one environment that Capstone has created for our digital uh, learning. Amy, I have so much to tell you about this, but I'm going to start with, as a former teacher who used Pebble Go in classrooms with teachers, I often co-taught with them, we would first bring it into the classroom as part of their animal research project at a station. So it's a place where you can bring students as young as kindergarten and feel safe that they're getting trusted content as they're doing their research on animals. Then now fast forward how many years as a product manager, I get to hear and talk to teachers and students often. And I often hear from teachers about the need to keep students in a safe place so that they know what they're going to access. And I think I got you, I hear you on that. And then they also talk about wanting to expose their students to multiple types of resources. So databases and eBooks. And so this fall we launched One Environment. So you'll see Capstone Interactive eBooks on one tab, Pebble Go on another tab, and Pebble Go Next on another tab, all on one page, if you have all three products which means one login to access all of your resources. Or if you use a direct link, which means you can get your students right in without having them use a username or password, that direct link gets you to all three resources in one place. Well, and I know that that's huge because it doesn't take much for our littles to find themselves completely not where they're supposed to be online. And so the, the the fewer options we can give our students, the more likely we are for them to land and be in that in that very controlled safe space in which Capstone has provided this curated information for our students that is going to always be age appropriate. And having spent a lot of time with kindergarten, the less tools and apps that I can send them out to, the better. If I can get them into that one safe, trusted spot and let them explore, that makes my heart happy. <laughs> yes, this was one of my stations that my teachers always wanted to create as their centers in their in their classrooms. They're like, whoa, 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 I'd leave it on the screen. And they'd come in, they go, oh, how do we do that in our room? And it was a great center, a real popular place. If you've got some some Chromebooks or you've got some some uh, desktops that you have in your in your classroom, this is a wonderful place for our students to spend some time. Angie, thank you so much. And I hope you come back next week and let us know a little bit more about Capstone. I'll see you then. Friends, I am so grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 5. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone Interactive eBooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and eBooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for today's episode, Champion Defender, and my conversation with Martha Hickson. Martha Hickson. 
Erickson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Friends, we are so lucky to have Martha join us today, and you'll hear why in just a minute. Martha, would you let us know where in the country you work, describe your current library, what grades you support, and what kinds of programs you offer? Sure. I am a high school librarian at North Hunterdon High School in Annandale, New Jersey. That is in the northwest corner of New Jersey, sort of right near the Pennsylvania border. Um, And I offer the typical high school library programs. Uh, We have a very um, relaxed and inviting library. So kids come in all day to, to hang out in the comfortable furniture. I have dozens and dozens of board games. I have a maker space, um, all the stuff the kids love. This year, I added a typewriter, and it's the light of my life watching the kids try to figure out how to use ye old-fashioned typewriter. Um, it's great. And then in terms of instruction, it's the usual stuff that everybody's doing in terms of uh, research, information literacy, media literacy, uh, all that kind of stuff. Wonderful. One of my regrets is my first library, I had four manual typewriters. And it was really helpful because I was teaching littles keyboarding. And to be able to say to them, and I could sort of date them and I say, look, you know, what we're learning now is not going to change. (laughs) (laughs) And they they loved it. And I, I couldn't find the ribbons for any of them, but they loved them. And the click clack went on all day long. The best part is watching the kids. I'll see a group of like four or five teenagers standing around this thing trying to figure out how to put paper in it. And it takes like a crew of them to figure it out. It's so entertaining. <laughs> well, that and where is the power button? <laughs> so, yeah, so Martha, you know, I love showcasing librarians who have received awards. It is so inspiring and it empowers listeners who like to set goals for themselves. In this case, however, we're talking about the American Library Association's 2022 Lemony Snicket Prize for Noble Librarians Faced with Adversity. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, right. Thanks. Um, it's not the prize anybody should aspire to. It's kind of the booby prize, although I should say it's a really nice award. But um, it's nothing I had ever put on my bucket list of things I'd love to win. <laughs> Well, and friends, I do have a bucket list playlist, and I'm a little hesitant because along there is the, you know, serving on committees like the Newberry and the Caldecott and the I Love My Librarian and the Odyssey Award, and and then there's you. (laughs) Now, do you know how long this award has been in place? Because I think it's relatively new, isn't it? Um, I don't think it's like super new. I, I, I'm going to guess, I think about eight to 10 years. Right. Okay. And friends, I'll make sure to include a link in the show notes. You know, friends, I've included a link to a podcast episode, which Martha was one of four guests speaking on a panel, quote, banned books, a conversation, end quote. And I'll include a link in the show notes. But you know, Martha, I love this conversation. However, I really just wanted to hear you. (laughs) So as a result, we're going to give you the stage today. Well, you might be one of the few that still wants to hear from me, Amy. I feel like I've been talking um, nonstop since June, and I'm thinking, does anybody really want to hear my voice anymore? But So it's nice to hear that there are a few people who are interested. Well, and I'm going to guarantee you, I think all of us would like to learn from your experiences and And as difficult as it is, and as selfish as it is to ask you to share some of this, I can guarantee you that our listening audience is hoping to avoid some of the unpleasantries that you have been, you've been put through the ringer. Well, I have, but so have so many other librarians, including, I fear, um, some who might be listening to us right now. We were just talking before we came on about our... uh, mutual uh, friend over distance, Amanda Jones. She's one who comes immediately to mind. So there are lots of us who have been through this. And um, uh, Amanda and I are both here to prove that a mis- misery does love company, although we would just rather avoid the misery to begin with. Well, and I, I think that when we as spectators are watching what 
some of our profession is going through, we're hoping to make sure that this is going to hopefully end better. Martha, you are certainly not the beginning of the wave of challenges, but you were early in in some of what was going on. School librarians have been warned. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, you know, it's a matter of when content on our shelves is challenged. You were ready, though. I was. And listeners will want to know, what did you have in place to anticipate the likelihood that books on your library shelves would be called into questions? Well, fortunately, when I went to library school longer ago than I care to believe, I graduated from Rutgers in 2005. Um one of the last classes I took before graduating was a library management class. And in that class, uh, we had to pull all sorts of important uh, documents and materials that would, we would need when managing in a library. And we did that while also doing a field experience in a library. I was extremely fortunate that I did my field experience in the library where I ended up being hired. So from the day I started work in that library, I knew what my selection policy was. I knew what my reconsideration policy was. I knew uh, what the where and how to find the reconsideration form. So all of that stuff was very well known to me. And I had very little use for it for quite a long time, <laughs> except for the selection policy, which I use all the time when I'm ordering materials. But the other two things, the reconsideration stuff, uh, it kind of gathered dust until 2019. And in 2019, I had an unfortunate situation with my principal and superintendent, who, um, it's a much longer story, but the, the essence of it is they tried to get me to remove uh, the book Fun Home by Alison Bechtel from the library on their say-so because they labeled it pornography. The superintendent said that it risked debauching the morals of minors. And I, anytime I say those words, I imagine him clutching his pearls, um, but I tried to explain to them that, no, that is not the way this works. And, you know, I let them know that to do that on your say-so now gives you permission to go through the entire school, anything you don't like, the color orange, I banish it, whatever. Um, and we went toe-to-toe for many months over this. And um, I had, that gave me some muscles and experience to know what to do the next time this came around. Um, and as a result of that, I put together, um, a little challenge toolkit. I'll pop it into the show notes for you. Um, and I did that not only to remind myself what to do if this ever came up again, but to help others. Um, and so it has all, almost like a checklist of all the things you should do in this emergency. Wow. So I had all of that to rely on. But you were prepared. So, you know, Martha, I will say, first of all, um, I started library school in 2001. Uh, I believe, actually, the same month the Twin Towers fell. Also was coincidentally pregnant with twins that semester. And um, I've told listeners I, I took that first exam with my Sprite and a sleeve of saltines. <laughs> Breakfast of champions. That's right. And I, our, our sons were born the following spring. But I finished my library program in 2007 because Wayne State generously gave us that, that window of opportunity but, you know, six years and, but when my son started kindergarten, mommy was ready to go back to work. <laughs> it's interesting. My library school experience has a September 11th connection too. Um, when I say I finished library school in 2005, it makes me sound much more youthful than I actually am. But I had had a 20 year career before that. I was in a, in corporate life. And, um, on that day, September 11th, I was working in public relations for AT&T, uh, I, at that job I, I had at that time, I was the speechwriter for the president of the company. And I love my paycheck. And that's about it. <laughs> and when I watched those towers fall, I really, in the weeks thereafter, I really did a kind of take stock of my life and did an inventory. And I thought, is there something better I could be doing with my time and talent? And um, I decided to move on. Well, and the field of 
of Library Science is incredibly grateful for your service. You know, I I want to ask you, when you talk about your reconsideration policy, I've always had a reconsideration policy, but it's been one for all educational materials, not for the library specifically. And I've been warned against doing that because we should not be held to the same standard as, say, instructional materials in a classroom, because we're talking about independent reading. We're talking about books that choose can choose or not choose. I agree with you, and I am very lucky um, that I inherited this wonderful uh, selection and reconsideration policy. I have, um, I'm not sure which, but at least one of my two uh, predecessors in this position to thank for it. Um, Our reconsideration policy is actually kind of considered the gold standard in the state of New Jersey. I have people asking for my reconsideration policy all the time. It is um, our selection and our reconsideration policy are separate from the instructional materials policy. Um, But I do find that I have to um, consistently educate administrators that there is a difference. Um, I have had a number of, you know, little skirmishes over books over the years, um, having to do with independent reading in a classroom setting, never elevated to the point of a challenge. But every time that has come up, I've had to educate the administrator to say, okay, there is a difference between a library book and assigned classroom reading. It's just not something that they know instinctively. It's one of the things we have to be proactive about educating them on. But I'm very thankful for our uh, reconsideration policy. Jumping back to that 2019 Fun Home incident for just a moment, um, when it became clear that I was not going to relent and automatically remove Fun Home uh, because the superintendent waved a magic wand, the next step that the superintendent took was to change the policy. Well, of course, my head popped off. And that was really the bulk of the battle was getting the old policy, the gold standard that I referred to restored. And it exists to this day. Would you be at all able to share the gold standard reconsideration policy with us in the show (laughs) notes, please? Certainly. I'll put that in the show notes. Let me jot a note. Yes. And, And friends, can I just say... I was very fortunate to see Fun Home, the musical. Me too. When it came, oh, so fantastic. On Broadway. And, and I got to tell you, I didn't know it was a book first. <laughs> so truly, I, I hope it, it makes it come, come around because it was a wonderful show. And then, I, of course, I read the book and oh, so loved it. You mentioned library school. And I got to tell you, like challenges that was like a just a toss out there. Oh, and by the way, if anybody comes after a book, you need to have a reconsideration policy. I think the conversation was about five minutes long. But I do remember my instructor in library school saying that no book is worth your job. Can I ask, did you ever worry for your job? In 2019, I definitely did. Um, that was my, you know, my first big scare. Uh, And it was me against the superintendent. And although he never said it directly to me, because we have this insane chain of command reporting structure, um, where, you know, the message gets filtered down to you, and I'm never allowed to speak directly to the great high and mighty. Uh, But he had made, um, he had threatened filing tenure charges against me because I was not (laughs) abiding by his edicts. so I was a little nervous about that, but I have a, a very dear friend of long standing who is a, um, a former board president. And I enlisted him as my ally during all of this to sort of, you know, be my sanity coach. And he was like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. That's not why they file tenure charges. Uh, so he sort of talked me off the ledge on that. In this most recent incident that uh, began in September of last year, um, I, you know, the thought crossed my mind from time to time, uh, but then the logical part of my brain took over. Uh, things that would prompt the thought to cross my mind were um, the administrators who were involved being very actively antagonistic and accusatory, refusing to speak to me, not sharing information. Um, but I had strong support from my union. The NJEA assigned me an attorney, and once I got the attorney on board, um, I knew that 
if they wanted to try to do something that ridiculous, um, they were going to have to fight for it. And I just knew that they wouldn't fight for it. So I really didn't have serious concerns about my job. The more serious concerns were, would I want to stay in my job under these working conditions? That's a, a response that, unfortunately, I have heard again and again, is that after the experience, it's just untenable to stay in that position. You know, this is where all of us are in very different circumstances. So little little asterisks here, little caveat. Um, friends, be aware of obviously different circumstances if you are tenured are not tenured. Because I know, it, at least in our state of Michigan, if you are not tenured in your first four years, you are at will and they can let you go for no reason whatsoever. And so be very aware of your own circumstances in your, in the state or the country that you work in. And, and also recognize if you if you're in a union uh, versus not in a union. And I, I know that those are sometimes things we have no control over if, if there isn't a, a union in your, in, your, uh, in your region, your state. So again, these are things that you need to sort of contextualize and remember that, that everybody's experience going into this is going to be slightly different. So would you give us a timeline? Because you, you talked a little bit about this being the 2019 incident, but now let's focus on last year and what brought us to this point. Sure. Can you give us an idea of the timeline from when the first challenge hit until the resolution when this nightmare was put to rest? Too much. <laughs> and it's still consuming me. Um, it started on September 28th of last year. So I've just passed the first anniversary of the destruction of my life. Um, and it began that day at lunchtime as I sat at my desk reading the New York Times book review. It was a Tuesday and the principal walked in, which he almost never does, uh, and said he had heard a rumor that there was going to be a complaint about a book at that evening's board meeting. I said, oh, really? Which book? He told me Genderqueer. I immediately pulled out reviews for Genderqueer printed them, put them in his hands, gave him a printed copy of the selection policy, the reconsideration policy, the materials uh, reconsideration form, uh, and reminded him that here is the process we follow in such a situation. We do not, the process does not involve the first step of being a hissy at the board meeting. Uh, and he nodded and assent at all of that, having been through the 2019 fun home situation with me. And um, he left my office. Um, that night at seven o'clock when the board meeting started, instead of watching Jeopardy, as I normally do at that hour, and Slay, by the way, um, my husband and I watched the board meeting. And there was an hour of the usual boring board business. But just as we the eight o'clock hour came upon us, all hell broke loose. And um, a group of parents was there. A parent did indeed stand up and started reading aloud from not genderqueer to start with, but lawn boy. And the reading aloud is kind of putting it generously. Uh, she was reading from a list of uh, the, the most salacious words and passages she could find. It sort of sounded like she was having some sort of fit or seizure. Um, and then she moved on to genderqueer, where she had excised, you know, what she believed to be the most offensive images. And she brought enough copies for the room, which is so nice. So she distributed those around the room, and there were audible gasps, and oh my god. Uh, and then as she wrapped up, <laughs> her grand finale of that presentation was to label me by name, this old gal, Martha Hickson, <laughs> as a pornographer, pedophile, and groomer of children. That's a little trio that we've come to become very familiar with over the last year. Uh, she also did the same uh, to the Board of Education, labeling them uh, with those appellations uh, as an entity. Her performance was followed by that of a man who was just beside himself with rage over the uh, existence of banned books week um, as if it was something I had invented and how dare it be celebrated. Um, and his contention was that banned books week is sort of luring and tempting students into degradation. And I was doing so by offering students 
a $10 Dunkin' Donuts gift card to enter our Banned Books Week contest, the essence of which was to get them to use the freaking library catalog to tell me which of the most frequently banned books are owned in our library. Uh, there were several more speakers after that. Um, the board sat in silence through all of this, did not utter a word that night, nor, I might add, for the next five months regarding my reputation. Um, of course, at home, I'm like freaking out. <laughs> I'm having all the feels at home, you know, my body is like, I'm shaking, I felt like um, a thermometer with the mercury rising, like the heat rising up to my head, queasy in the stomach, Um, so I had that panic moment, and then, again, the logic part of the brain kicked in, and I'm like, hang on, Martha, you know what to do, I picked up my cell phone while the meeting is still going on, people are still ranting and raving about me, and I'm on the cell phone, um reporting the challenges to uh, ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom, National Coalition Against Censorship, Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, National Council of Teachers of English, all of which have online reporting forms. You can submit them anonymously if you need to, if you're afraid of retaliation, but I didn't care. At that point, (laughs) I needed all the help I could get. And I also emailed my uh, union in that moment. The next day when I got into school, I started reaching out to my library community, uh, the New Jersey Association of School Librarians, New Jersey Library Association, and I also alerted the uh, Gender and Sexuality Alliances in our two schools. We are a two-high school district, uh, and because uh, the two books that they went after that night, Gender Queer and Lawn Boy, both had LGBTQ themes, I thought it was important that the kids know something's up. In the ensuing days, um, the challengers uh, decided that they were going to actually follow the process, uh, and they filled out formal challenge documents, ultimately to five books, Gender Queer, Lawn Boy, All Boys Aren't Blue, uh, This Book is Gay, and, you know, just because oldies are goodies, fun home! <laughs> so those were the five. Um Also in that time frame, as October came upon us, I started getting hate mail from parents to my school email address. Some of the kids who were associated with this process began engaging in nuisance vandalism in the library, coming in and seeking out books on sexuality and gender identity and um, removing them from the shelves, hiding them throughout the library, turning them so the spines were backwards and couldn't be found, you know, easily on the shelf, misshelving them. The parents even went so far as to try to press charges. They contacted the county prosecutor's office and the local police department. While all that nonsense was going on, uh, a reconsideration committee was formed um, to one committee to deal with all five books. Um, And I started creating backup documentation for each of the five books, compiling uh, reviews, best of lists, awards, if there had been any previous challenges, where and what was the outcome and so forth. So there would be documentation for the reconsideration committee to work with. As we approached the end of October, October 26th was the next Board of Education meeting. They had to move the location from the board office, which seats about 40 people, to the uh, auditorium at school, which seats about, I don't know, 500. And it was packed. There were about 400 people there. The ratio was about 30 book banners who were easily identifiable by the placards they held up uh, in honor of Jesus, and uh, the remainder were I know, the remainder were people who were opposed to book banning. Um, it was an amazing evening, and it was an amazing evening because of the people who spoke in defense of books, most notably the kids who spoke in defense of books. The students came out um, in force. And they were magnificent. They were prepared. They were poised. They were professional. Uh, They followed the rules, which, of course, the book banners on the other side refused to do. But the really heartbreaking thing is a couple of them left the podium in tears because these 15 and 16-year-olds who were defending their right to read in the library, uh, many of whom um, identify as on the LGBTQ uh, or among the LGBTQ community themselves, were taunted and jeered by the people holding the placards proclaiming their Christianity. Uh, <laughs> November, 
uh, by November, there was still no decision, no status, no information at all about what the reconsideration committee was up to. But around mid-November, I had been keeping my eye on Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, they had the same pair of books, Gender, Queer, and Lawn Boy, that started the conflagration in my community, had been objected to in their community about a week before uh, our issue. And in mid-November, Fairfax, Virginia, reached a decision on its reconsideration and decided to keep them both. So I made sure that my administrators got copies of that news coverage, Um, and another board meeting was held that month. It was two days before Thanksgiving, so attendance was somewhat smaller, but the ratio was the same, uh, that the book banners were vastly outnumbered. Fast forward to late January, the first indication we had that the Reconsideration Committee had finished its work was when the board uh, meeting agenda came out, um, I don't know, January 25th, something like that, on a Friday night before the Tuesday board meeting, I go rifling through the agenda, and there it is, the recon- a link to the Reconsideration Committee report. I take a look at it. The Reconsideration Committee recommended keeping four of the books, but there was a resolution on the agenda for the board meeting on Tuesday night to ban This Book is Gay. And I was like, hell no, <laughs> it's not happening. So I spent the weekend um, making sure that I had speakers lined up. Thanks to COVID, you don't hear that very often, uh, the meeting was going to be held completely virtually. So geography was not uh, a boundary here. I could reach out to alumni who had moved away, um, people who find it inconvenient to come to a board meeting. And One of the things that struck me that Friday night, don't know why I didn't do this before, but maybe it was the urgency, was when I looked at the cover of This Book is Gay, do you know whose name is on it besides Juno Dawson? David Levithan, who wrote the introduction to the North American edition. Now, I know David works in New York City. He's originally from New Jersey, and I knew he must live somewhere in the tri-state area, so I thought... Let me see if I can get to David. So Saturday morning, that signal goes out. I sent out a message to the NJSA listserv. And I was like, does anybody have anybody, you know, anybody who knows how to get in touch with David Levithan? Two hours later, David Levithan and I are trading emails. That is the power of your library network, my friends. We are wise. We are powerful. We are connected. So David agreed to write a statement to the Board of Education under one condition. He said, please have a student read it on my behalf, because he's been through this before. He is a frequently banned author, and he knows that boards of education are going to listen to a kid much more than they're going to listen to him. So Tuesday night rolls around. I've got an action-packed list of folks ready to talk at the board meeting, and they did, and they were awesome. And I spoke at the board meeting as well via Zoom. The vote comes. I'm biting my fingernails at home. And to my never-ending amazement, the Board of Education decided not to follow the recommendation of its reconsideration committee, and they retained all five books. Um, And at home, I cried like a baby (laughs) because I was so relieved. a couple things really stand out and and I'm so lucky because I get to have this conversation and I get to see Martha and and it's 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 I just I just want to reach out and this whole experience is so exhausting you know a couple things that that stand out is you can remember every day every detail it's like you're picturing it in your mind's eye and I remember there are, all, for all of us, dates and times and memories that will never go away for good reasons and for bad reasons and for things that upset us terribly. And this has clearly all happened to you, and it is not going away. You you will forever be changed by this experience. And I, I did not fully appreciate how consuming this is because you become almost as advocate, you become almost, you know, the, the preparation for this is almost resembles a trial and, and you're the, you're the lawyer providing evidence. 
That's true. And speaking of evidence and memory, um, and this is a piece of advice for anybody going through this, um, one of the things I learned during the 2019 situation that I applied here, and here's a weird reference, um, James Comey, former FBI director, inspired it, is taking contemporaneous notes. If you remember way back when, when James Comey entered our, entered our consciousness, it was because after his interactions with the president, he would go home and write contemporaneous notes so that he would remember exactly what was said by whom and when. I started doing that in 2019 during that situation, and I did the same thing here. Uh, so that's why all of this is so vivid for me. And I have referred to those notes repeatedly um, as I've been asked to write about this situation, uh, as now as I've been asked to speak about it. That's why a lot of it is so vivid. Plus the fact that it, you know, when you have fear <laughs> combined or anger or intense emotion combined with an event, it tends to imprint on your, your brain quite significantly. Um, but even though the books were saved that on that fateful night in January, the story was not over because guess who was still walking around as a pedophile pornographer and groomer of children? Because the board had said nothing in my defense. I had worked for this school district for 17 years with distinction. I had never had less than the very highest level of an appraisal in those 17 years. And no one could muster up a syllable of support. I was not happy. <laughs> So that next month, uh, before the February board meeting, it was a uh, full court press uh, in terms of a letter writing campaign to say, hey, board, you got to still have a mess to clean up. And so at the February board meeting, the president of the Board of Education read a prepared statement in which uh, the board declared the charges against me to be unfounded. I was like, OK, I guess that's all I'm going to get out of you, but <laughs> I'll take it after this uh, late date. So all of that ended the immediate crisis. But believe me when I tell you um, that this issue continues to dominate my daily life, um, both in terms of the harassment that I receive anytime my name shows up online anywhere. Um, there are forces at work out there that have just really unpleasant things to say about me. Uh, there are forces within my very own district that continue to have um, unpleasant things to say about me. Uh, and it also dominates my life in terms of ongoing advocacy. Three of the people who uh, were active in trying to ban the books are now running for Board of Education seats. Uh, so I am spending <laughs> every waking hour at this point working nonstop to prevent that. And if I take a look at the last year, um, the number of hours I have devoted to this issue, it's just impossible to calculate it. Impossible. Well, and friends, can I just say, because I know it's an what we call an off-year election here in the United States. Uh, it is not a presidential election. So typically... There aren't nearly the number of people as invested in this this round of elections. And yet, I know that school boards around the country, this has become contentious because even in districts where we haven't experienced this type of, of uh, attack on the librarian, this is still brought many of our school board elections to the forefront as being one way that that a community become can exercise that kind of oversight over what is being taught in our schools, just writ large. So, you know, I, I, I feel that in my own community. And even though we haven't had a, a, a something as ugly as what you've gone through, you know, I, I just feel like you, you're still a target. Oh, definitely still a target. In fact, I just had a conversation with a coworker today where I said, you know, I don't see a good ending for me and the library uh, once the election's over. So let's say, you know, one or all three of these people get elected to the board. Well, that's a no brainer. Uh, <laughs> I am going to be right in their sights and they're going to look to make life, my life miserable. But I'm also fairly confident that if they lose, they're not going away. They're coming right back and they're going to start going after books again. So, um, 
yeah, I, I, I don't see that I'll be able to relax come November 9th. Regarding board elections, though, I do want to say I have had lots of conversations with people. Um, and so many people will say to me, especially people of a certain vintage, like my own vintage, will say... <laughs> Well, you know, I don't have kids in the school district anymore. I don't have kids, so board of I don't pay attention to board of education elections. And I have to explain to them, well, you own a house, right? <laughs> uh, your property value is tied to the quality of the schools in your community. You want to live in a community where kids are well educated, kids have opportunities, kids have freedom to learn and grow. So just this past week, I had an op-ed published in the Star Ledger, which is New Jersey's uh, newspaper of record. Um, warning people about Board of Education elections and that we need to keep ignorance and intolerance off of our board. If you want, Amy, I'll send you a link to that op-ed. Those talking points can be used anywhere, not just New Jersey. Well, and we've had a similar editorial that was written in our newspaper and here in Detroit, because the point is made, if you don't have kids who go to the school district, why should you care? And, And it absolutely is not the case. You know, I'm curious, could you give me some idea of how your coworkers sort of functioned around you? I, you must have been completely preoccupied in how this, you were, you were assaulted with, with so many insults and, and to be, to come under attack like that, how did your coworkers respond, if at all? Were they oblivious to what was going on? There were a variety of responses. I've already mentioned my union, um, which was very supportive. Uh, And I also, if I talk about coworkers, I have to talk about the best coworker in the world, which is Patricia Eggington Stark, my library clerk, uh, my right arm. Um, And she has been absolutely devoted to this issue with me. She and I have showed up at every board meeting since last September. She doesn't have to do that, but she does it because she's just loyal, devoted to me, devoted to the library. But in terms of the larger population of teachers, um, at that October board meeting, immediately after this happened, a a good number of teachers came out to that meeting um, in solidarity. But on a day-to-day basis, um, very few of them kind of approached me directly. I don't know whether they were fearful that I was going to like break down in front of them. (laughs) They'd have to be responsible for cleaning up the mess. Um, If the whole idea made them uncomfortable or if they just wanted to keep arms reach, but there seemed to be a a distance created uh, by all of this. Then there were other um, coworkers who actively shunned me, um, who believed what they heard and believed to this day what they heard at the board meeting um, and just crossed Martha off their list of people that they will speak to in the building. Um, and then there were others who sent me very, very lovely um, cards and messages of support um, that were extremely meaningful in that moment. So the reactions ran the gamut. It's hard for me to believe that people use religion as a defense for the behaviors that they choose. And yet it clearly happens all the time. Yeah, I try to, I really, really try hard to try um, to see their point of view. And in my most generous moments, (laughs) what I see is people who are deeply, deeply concerned about the state of the world and the direction uh, that their children are being pulled in and want to do everything possible to keep their kids on the straight and narrow. And that I understand. I mean, that's part of their job as a parent is to be uh, protective of their children and um, you know, keep them safe and out of harm's way. Um, it's the method that they choose to use that I can't relate to, that I can't understand. You know, my feeling is stay in your lane. So you can do whatever you want in your household, um, but it would be as crazy as me coming up to your disruptive child in the grocery store and disciplining them. These people would freak out if I did that, if I invaded their um, personal space to have anything to do with their child. Yet that's exactly what they're doing to other families and children, is invading their personal space, their right, um, and saying, no, you got to do it my way, because my way is the best way and the only way. Well, and when I talk to my own students, 
students and, and friends, my band book week display has become a shrine. It's not coming down. And yes, have I had to explain it to my administrator? Absolutely. Happy to do it. And you know, I get questions and the students ask questions. The teachers are delighted because the students are showing interest. We have some of those books in our curriculum and of course had to go through a thorough examination. But you know, that display is going to stay up because I continue to get questions from my students. When I talked to my own students about banned books, I said, listen, if people are concerned about the content in these books, then they need to ban the internet and take the phones out of their pockets. And you know what? If Parents are clearly not willing to do that. What I find so interesting is the content that is being targeted in book form that has to do primarily with people of color um, and uh, sex, sexuality, and gender. But when we talk about these other um, media to which kids have access, what concerns me much more is violence. I see kids, I walk through the cafeteria and I'll see kids on their Chromebooks and phones playing active shooter games at school. Meanwhile, we have five armed police officers in the hallway every day to prevent a real active shooter, but we're allowed to play active shooter all the time. I have yet to hear (laughs) someone show up at a board meeting to express concern about that. But, you know, normal human sexuality and normal uh, differences in terms of uh, race are problematic somehow. You know, I'm curious because you talked about all the students who came and spoke and and defended the books that were on the shelf in the collection, and I'm sure that they've said some lovely things about you, but I'm also concerned about some of that vandalism, that the shenanigans, which, That's such a cute you know, word. <laughs> in terms of... Yes, the shenanigans, uh, these 'er ne'er-do-wells who wanted to just upset and create disorder in your space. And I don't know if they were being prompted by their families, but I I think that they were being coached. And has any of that sort of tension remained or lingered with the students who come to your space? Uh, That thankfully has dissipated. Um, It reached its peak in the, say, two, three months immediately after that uh, September issue. But once the board decided to keep all five books, um, you know, kids have a pretty short attention span anyway. <laughs> and once it was no longer uh, the, the topic of conversation all throughout the school because the books were saved, that sort of nonsense um, went away. And I should be um, clear in saying that it was a very small handful of students, and you are correct that the small handful of students who was engaged in that were those who um, had um, shared a common last name with some of the book banners. It was definitely a cause and effect situation there between what the parents were doing and what the students were doing, whether of their own, own volition or coaching by parents, I can't say. While I'm sure listeners can imagine the stress and the upset you endured, we have no idea the mental and physical toll that the stress of the censorship scrutiny has taken on you and and what it has taken to recover from such an ordeal. Yeah, um, I don't know that I'm recovered, to be honest with you, but um, the worst of it was last October. There came a day last October, October 20th, that was just a perfect storm of crazy that um, hit me all at once. I had, you know, in the immediate wake of September 28th, I did what I usually do, which is just kind of keep my nose to the grindstone, just keep plugging away, plugging away, do the job, do the job. And I just kind of stuffed it all down. Uh, And October 20th, um, a bunch of stuff happened in quick succession. I had gotten a hate mail that morning at the principal's direction. I was uh, drafting a response to another piece of hate mail. Um, While I was doing that, the board office sent me a Freedom of Information Act request wanting all of the purchasing purchasing records for all of the books, some of which had been on the shelves for years. So I was trying to dig that up. The GSA kids walked into my office and they wanted a list of books in the library that had heterosexual sexual content so they could say, but what about these? And I said, hey, hey, kids, I get what you're trying to do, but let's not burn the whole damn library down. 
Um, so I got them out of the office and I committed to coming to their meeting that afternoon to meet with them to help them strategize in a more effective way. But when they left, my, my heart was pounding. I was sweating. I just wasn't feeling well. And in the previous couple of weeks, I had gone to the nurse's office a couple of times, never having been there once in 17 years, um, to get a blood pressure check. And that at that time, as it had been over the past couple of weeks, my blood pressure was seriously elevated. But that day it was 165 over 95. Normally it's in the you know, perfectly normal range. And when she gave me that number, I don't know what happened to me, but I just started crying. I couldn't catch my breath. I could not speak. And they finally called my husband to take me home. I went to my doctor the next day saying I could barely talk to her about what was going on. My husband had to come into the appointment with me. And, um, what had been going on up until that point was I had been unable to really get any decent sleep. Um, I was having all sorts of digestive distress. I want to, don't want to get too graphic, but, um, having a lot of trouble in the stomach area. Um, I, as a result, I could not eat. I was losing weight. Although these days I wish I could do that again. Um, I cracked two teeth from grinding my teeth. Um, so my doctor took one look at me. I'd seen the same doctor for 25 years, and she was like, this is not you. I know you, and this is not you. What we need to do right away is remove you from the environment that is causing this. So she wrote me out of work. She gave me a prescription for anxiety medication, Lexapro to be specific, um, and she referred me to a therapist. At that time, I was 62. I'm a month away from being 63. Uh, in my six decades on the planet, I had never um, availed myself of mental health services, um, whether it was laziness or ign ignorance or what, but man, am I glad I did in this instance. It was extremely helpful. Um, I was seeing a therapist um, three times a week initially, uh, and that moved down, you know, as time wore on uh, to once a week um, as we got toward the end of January. But it was incredibly helpful. Um, other things that helped me uh, recover were physical activity and swimming. I love to do walking. I love to do. So during that time I was away from work, I amped that stuff way up. Um, and then keeping a regular sleep routine. One of the things that the therapist worked me on with, with me on was sleep hygiene. So establishing a routine, having a calming routine like herbal tea, setting a bedtime, all that kind of stuff to sort of reset and get myself back to normal. Um, I say that I, I don't know that I'm fully recovered because, um, and I don't want to to uh, trivialize um, anybody's wartime experience, certainly by any means. But I also almost feel like there are times when I have PTSD. Um, if I'm watching television and I see a contentious board meeting, I start feeling it in my body again. It takes me right back to that night. Um, so it's, there are things that will trigger me. <laughs> so grateful and I feel incredibly selfish to have asked questions that have made it possible for all of this to come back up to the surface. But if I promise you, I press record for a reason because I am the lucky one who gets to meet you, but everyone is going to benefit from hearing what you can share with us in this lived experience. So I'm curious, Martha, you know, in all of this process, you know, there has to be a place where we sort of reflect on what happened and, and how to prevent anything like this from happening again. Can you share a little bit about that process that you went through? Sure. Um, after the board decision was made, and this can apply to anybody, regardless of the outcome of your challenge, whether you retain the book or you lose the book, um, you've had an opportunity to use your policy in the process to an extent that you never have before. So it is worth doing a postmortem, a debrief to look at it. Um, and I had a group that I worked with called the North Hunter and Voorhees Intellectual Freedom Fighters. That is a community group that formed around that 2019 fun home situation. And they were with me through this situation as well. And um, after everything was over, 
we pulled apart the process, the policy, and the reconsideration report, and we created a 17-page document uh, where we outlined the numerous lapses that we observed in the policy and the process and opportunities for improvement. I should add here, though, that we did that um, with the help guidance of an amazing organization called everylibrary.org. Um, if you are not connected with everylibrary.org now, you need to be. You need to start sending them money, like a little $5 every month or something, because John Kratzka from Every Library, I met him last December at our New Jersey Association of School Librarians conference, and I just thought, maybe he can help me. I'll talk to him. And he was so helpful. He stayed by my side virtually um, through the phone, email, and Zoom for eight weeks until we got over this hump. But um, at John's recommendation, we did this postmortem uh, and submitted it to the board. Now, has the board done anything with it? What do you think? <laughs> no, they have not. But we continue to pester them about it. I think, like many people around the United States, this next election cycle is going to change the dynamic both on the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. And I think for many reasons, we should all be very aware of how important our vote is. And, and to our, our, our listeners around the world, unfortunately, the United States is not necessarily uh, nearly as committed to the, the the importance of voting in every election. Um, we tend to get very revved up about the presidential election. And then during off years, we tend to sort of take a little break. But I think after this election, there are going to be some changes at the national, the state, and the local level. I'm wondering, Martha, you've been through so much is there anything that you haven't already shared with us that you want to make sure that listeners learn from, from this absolutely exhausting process that you've been put through? Well, there have been a number of things that I share with people pretty regularly about what it is that I learned through the process. Um, and I figure if it was new to me, uh, or if it's something I learned, maybe it's something others need to learn too. And we've, we've alluded to the importance of self-care, but I put that, that always at the top of my list. Because if you're down for the count, as I was briefly after that October 20th breakdown, ain't nothing going to happen. So self-care is vital. Um, I also remind people that this is not a one-person job. You must ask for help. And for us as school librarians, that is sometimes difficult to do. We are accustomed to being the problem solvers. And for many of us, like me, like you perhaps, we are like the sole proprietor in the library. We got to do it all. And we're not used to asking people for help. You got to get over that, honey. Ask for help. Um, paying attention is important, too. There's a part of my story where I think I mentioned Fairfax, Virginia. When those that pair of books first came up, Lawn Boy and Gender Queer, I'm like, huh, that's a weird combination of books. Where would that come from? Well, I, when I, the next day when I looked it up, I had found that Fairfax, a district in Texas, and one in Ohio had experienced the same challenges the week before. I hadn't been paying attention. I need to be reading the newsletter from the Office for Intellectual Freedom every week. I need to be reading Book Riot every week. So when these odd things come up, they're already on my radar and I can recognize them for what they are. Um, I also learned, um, even though they were calling me awful things by name, it really wasn't about me. It was about the position Anybody in this job would have been called the same thing. Um, these, <laughs> it's all interchangeable, and they're all using the same script around the country, so it really wasn't about Martha Hickson, um, and it took me a while to get to that point. Uh, it's also not about the books. They, this has nothing to do with books. These people have not read the books. They never will read the books. This is all about politics, power, and change, and the books are just an easy instrument to achieve that. Um, but by the same token, I also had to get my point to myself to the point to realize, okay, they're only books. So if the worst had happened, if one or all five of those books had gotten away, I can't, um, be too precious about the books. In the end, 
they are paper, ink, and glue. We remove books from libraries all the time in the process called weeding. Um, so although it would have been extremely painful to see them go under these circumstances, I know what a wonderful collection I have built. I know that there are other books on these topics. I can get more books on these topics. So as you said initially, it's not worth losing your job over. And then it's important to treat this as an opportunity to test drive your policies and processes. This is a hopefully <laughs> once in a blue moon opportunity and you want to make sure you've got a good uh, process and policy. Um, don't stop is another thing I tell people all the time. And aim high, like seeing if you can get David Levithan. The worst they can do is say no, right? So you don't want to leave any cards on the table. Play them all. grateful for this opportunity to talk with you. And, you know, I know that this listening community is grateful for your candor and your willingness to share. But the really fantastic thing about this is you've taken so much of your energy and you've channeled it in ways that are incredibly, you know, sort of generous and clever so that, could you give us some idea, you know, first of all, you mentioned at the beginning, you've been talking about this experience to anybody who asks you. I have. And it's uh, hilarious because a year ago at this time, I could not get anybody to listen. Now I can't get people to leave me alone. <laughs> and that's all thanks to the whole Lemony Snicket thing. Nobody cared about Martha to Lemony Snicket. So thank you, Daniel Handler, if you're out there. Um, but yeah, uh, there is much more interest now. So I feel it's my responsibility to seize this moment and get the message out there. Well, and use the platform that you've been given and this opportunity to raise the profile of how we respond under fire. You've written a chapter in an upcoming book. I have. It's called... Um Perspectives from the Field, The Fight Against Book Bans. Shannon Oltman at University of Kentucky is the editor, and it's coming out in spring of 23 from Libraries Unlimited. When that comes out, you better be sure I'm going to be putting that out on social media. You are speaking at conferences about your experience. This is something that, unfortunately, you relive in front of audiences, but grateful audiences. Yeah, in fact, I just did um, a session yesterday um, for a group of public librarians here in New Jersey who were interested in knowing um, how public librarians can partner with school librarians to help in this effort. And um, several of them wrote to me afterwards to ask questions, and I responded to one, and I said, you know, I almost feel a little guilty when I, when I do these presentations because – in some ways, it is therapeutic for me to talk about it in the way like handling snakes <laughs> is a helpful aversion therapy for those who are afraid of snakes. Um, but I feel I, I'm like, I'm always hoping it's helpful to those who are listening uh, because it is helpful for me to talk about it. It's your story and nobody else can tell it and nobody can take away the experiences that you have and so, no, this is about owning it and making sure that nobody deprives you of what you went through to achieve what you did. Yeah, but I also, I, you know, it gets a little tiring to be talking, me, 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 woe is me. And I always want to make sure that I am acknowledging the tremendous, tremendous contributions of the kids, um, most especially, and the community um, and my librarian community, because none of this would have been possible without those three elements as well. I, I will be sharing many resources, many resources in the show notes, thanks to all of the documentation and, and the coverage that Martha has received. But you were a consultant on a website intended to support librarians who find themselves defending a collection. I was. And remember earlier, I talked about the awesome Rockin' New Jersey Library community. Well, one of the former members of our awesome Rockin' New Jersey Library community, Arlen Kimmelman, who's now uh, living in the Southwest. Um, she moved away from us, but she has not forgotten us. And uh, she reached out to me uh, this summer. She's now working for a company called IORAD. Uh, and I do recommend everyone check out IORAD. 
It's this awesome little tool. It's free. I use it in my instruction and it's great. How many times a day do you have a kid coming up to you and saying, how do I, and they're asking you for something that you've told them 900 times how to do. Like you, you're using something on the catalog. IR Rad lets you record very quick little demos um, that you can say, oh, here, just go look at that. Anyway, so uh, Arlen wanted to know, gee, is there any way that IR Rad could help with this whole banned book situation? And I gave it some thought and I had two big ideas uh, for Arlen. And one was to show uh, members of the general public and the library community as well how it is that you report challenges. So we could use the IRAD tool to show people how to go to these various organizations that I've mentioned and report your challenge. Similarly, because I am so um, very grateful to the support of these organizations, um, I wanted people to know how to um, uh, fund them. They're all nonprofits and they need donations. So if you are of a mind and within your means to donate to these uh, places. So we created uh uh, IRAD demos of the donation piece too. So um, that's what we did. Oh, that's fantastic. Martha, you are truly a champion in the eyes of the school community and your professional community. Let us know how we can follow you on social media. I am at sassy underscore librarian. Now the trick is because of all of this nonsense, sassy underscore librarian is locked down, but I uh, am very open to uh, having librarians follow me. So if I can see that you're a librarian, you're in. (laughs) Fantastic. Thank you so much, Martha. I appreciate all the time that you have shared with us tonight. My pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation. Friends, I know I say this every single time I interview a guest for this show, but you are definitely going to want to make sure to carve out some time for the resources in our show notes. Martha so generously has shared the very tools which she used to defend her collection against the censors who would come and remove books from her bookshelf. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. One last friendly reminder, friends, I encourage you to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more using the code UNITED. The topic of episode 200 will be Got Graphic Novels? Now What? And my conversation with Sarah Smith. I hope you will tune in.